expecting the most from your NDIS plan and being well prepared for your annual review. I'll be your facilitator and my name is Belinda and your presenter today is Robin Lang. We begin all our webinars with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians, past and present, on whose lands we meet today. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. An introduction to Robin now. So Robin started her work venture with MS as the peer support coordinator in 2011. In 2014, Robin took on the role of NDIS advisor, where she works to help others to understand the significance of NDIS and its intricacies. The eligibility criteria, the opportunities the scheme offers to help people lead a more ordinary life, the role of local area coordination, and how to request reviews of decisions that potential participants may require. Robin has also developed NDIS resources including information sheets, frequently asked questions, and webinars and workshops for clients, NDI planners and the local area coordinators, all of which a culmination of her ongoing learnings of the ever-expanding NDIS. Robin is very much committed to the concept of the NDIS and helping people get the most um, and the best possible outcomes from it. So I'm going to hand over um, to Robin now to begin the presentation. Hi everyone and um, thanks for joining us today and thanks Belinda for facilitating today. So I'll just move straight into it because you know what we're going to be talking about today but I'll just give you an idea of um, hopefully the sort of information that you will um, you'll be walking away with at the end of today. So hopefully you will have a better understanding of the support categories in your plan you'll have a better understanding of how to activate and get the most out of it, what to do if your circumstances have changed and the supports and services in your plan are not meeting your needs, and how to be really well prepared for an annual review. So I'm going to be giving you quite a lot of information today and I'll stop every so often, probably at the end of each section, um, to check with Belinda to see if you have any questions. So please, if um, if you've got any questions, type them in. Um, and if there are lots, Belinda may well stop me, but I will pause um, regularly just to check in with everyone to make sure that you're keeping up and that I can answer any questions you have at the time. So the first thing I would like to do is um, help you to understand the support categories that are in your plan. So you can think about the support categories under the three C's, and that's core supports, capital supports, and capacity building supports. And now I'm gonna run through each of them so that you, you can see how you can spend the money in your plan and how to make the most out of it. So core supports, this is the most flexible part of your budget. You can generally use um, your core budget funds in one support category to purchase supports under another category, unless the funds have been set aside for a specific purpose, such as, a, um, for instance, a periodic payment for transport, or if a core budget item is, um, is for compensation, it's for specialised disability accommodation, or there's a term called stated item, and that means that you cannot use that money for something else if it's a stated item. It can only be used for that specific purpose. So let me just talk about each of those categories that you can see under core supports just quickly. So assistance with daily living, that might include things like personal activities, assistance with household tasks like cleaning um, and um, making sure that your home is well maintained. It might also be preparation and delivery of meals but uh, remember that the cost of the food is not included in the preparation and the deliver delivery of the meals. Or it might also be for short-term accommodation. And you might know, um, you might be more familiar with the term respite rather than short-term accommodation. So that's assistance with daily living and some of the things that, that you might be able to use that funding for. 
that is certainly not an exhaustive list. So the next one is transport allowance. And there are three levels of transport allowance. There's level one, which is around $1,600. And that's for participants who are not working, studying or attending day programs, but are seeking to, um, to have better community access. Level two of transport allowance is around $2,400. And that's for participants who are currently working or studying part time, which is about up to 15 hours a week, or who may be participating in day programs or for other social, recreational or leisure activities. Level three is around $3,400, and that's for participants who are currently working, looking for work or studying at least 15 hours a week, and are unable to use public transport because of their disability. That transport allowance can only be used for transport. The next one is assistance with social and community participation, and that would be in a centre or in what they term open activities. And finally, you've got consumables, and that covers things like continence equipment. So it might be pads, it might be um, uh, protective sheets that you put down on your bed. It could also be catheter um, equipment. And there's also some under consumables, there's also something called HEN, which stands for Home Enteral Nutrition. So that's for people who have substantial levels of um, impairment and might be um, being peg fed. So their core supports, I'll just, Belinda, unless there are any questions on any of those, I'll keep going. There's one um, question, Robin, from Kay, just asking about how participants ask for support in each of the support categories. So if you, okay, um, I might be reading something different into this question, but if you might not see in your plan that the support could category is called capital supports or core supports. What you might see is that term assistance with daily living. And you either, if you're confused about how you ask for um, to get a service put in place or what might be eligible under that specific heading, the best thing to do is either talk to your local area coordinator who would have helped you um, uh, would have discussed with you what your needs were and helped to, to provide the information to the agency to put your plan together. Or if you have support coordination funds in your plan, your support coordinator should be helping you to understand how you can use that funding. So I hope that um, helps with that question. Thanks, Robin. Okay. Okay, I'll keep going. All right, capital supports. Capital supports relate to supports such as assistive technology, sorry, assistive technology or modifications to your home. And these mostly depend on quotes from suppliers. Funds within this budget can only be used for their specific purpose. So for example, if, um, if you need rails in a bathroom or if you need a wheelchair, then that money must be spent on that, you can't spend it on something else. It cannot be used to fund other items. So under assistive technology, because there are two categories within capital supports, this includes equipment items for mobility. So it could be um, a wheelchair, it could be a scooter, it could be, um, uh, it could be um, something else like a, a walker. Um, items for personal care, maybe a shower chair, something like that, or for communication. So it might that also includes uh, vehicle modifications. Just to let you know with vehicle modifications that the agency is very reluctant to give funds for um, the modification of a vehicle if it's more than three years old. Uh, the other one is home modifications, and the things that are included in that are ramps, grab rails, door widening, um, and other things like bathroom modifications. And they all, as I said, depend on an assessment by an occupational therapist, and then quotes before you can actually get the funds released to buy that, either at that equipment or to have the home modification done. I'll move on to the, uh, the third C, which is capacity building supports. So capacity building funding is allocated across those nine categories that you can see on the screen. 
You can choose how to spend the funds to purchase any approved individual support within its category, but you cannot move funding from one category to another under capacity building. So if you got, say, some funding for improved daily living, you cannot use it on improved relationships or improved living arrangements. So how you spend it within its category is, is flexible, but you cannot move it into another one of those nine categories. Let me run through each of these nine for you so you've got a bit of an idea of what you might be able to spend some of that funding on if you've got that in your plan. So finding and keeping a job, that might be something like assistance to obtain or retain employment in the open or the supported labour market. Improved living arrangements would be help to obtain or retain appropriate accommodation. So that would include things like rental accommodation. Increased social and community participation. This is skills-based learning, such as something like an art class, sports coaching, and it includes the tuition fees. Support coordination, uh, that is funds to, to, for you to, um, to have a support coordinator to help you to understand and activate your plan. It's, it's a bit difficult to get um, and it's generally given to people who have quite complex needs, who um, are using a range of services across a number of sectors, people who have maybe have English as a second language, who don't have access to IT equipment like a laptop or iPad um, and people with a high level of um, impaired cognition. Improved relationships. And that's specialised assessments for complex needs or um, if somebody's requiring long-term or intensive supports to address behaviours of concern. Improved health and wellbeing. This is one where we find that a lot of people living with MS get, some, get funds. And that's physical wellbeing activities such as personal training, exercise physiology to increase or maintain physical mobility. It's dietetics and allied health assessments. Improved learning is skills training, advice and assistance with arrangements. Improved life choices is plan management funds. Um, and I'll just exp explain that briefly. That is money for you to um, employ the services of a plan manager to manage the funds in your plan for you so that you don't deal with any of the invoicing, the paying of bills, um, those sorts of things. It also includes building financial skills or somebody's organisational skills or their self-management skills. And finally, improved daily living, another one that we find a lot of people with MS get funds for. This is funds for assessments. Um, so that would be your OT or physio assessments or continence assessments, speech therapy assessments, might also be training, uh, the development or increase in skills for independence and community participation. Um, and that can be in groups or individually. So they're the three categories that you receive funding under, the three Cs, core, um, capital and capacity building. So Belinda, before I move on, um, any questions at this stage? Yeah, there's a couple of questions, Robin. Um, so we've got a question here asking, um, what if you need an item urgently, like an over the toilet seat, how do you go about getting that? So some items you can get quickly as long as they're what they term um, low risk. And I think that is for, and don't quote me on, on this amount, but I think it's for items under either 500 or $1,000. Um, that you can that you can go and get yourself, but they have to be low risk. Otherwise, you have to wait for that OT assessment to go to the agency, for the agency to decide that it's reasonable and necessary, and then for the agency to release the funds to you. And Robin, does that matter whether it's um, specifically in the plan or not, the particular item that you're needing? Again, uh, I think the best way to determine that is to, and I'm going to talk about this in just a minute, is to have a conversation either with your support coordinator, if you have support coordination funds in your plan, 
or to your local area coordinator about the best way to go about doing that. They are the people who are, um, are there to help you to work out how to make this happen and how to make it happen in a timely manner so that you're not living at home in a risky situation or an unsafe situation. Great, thanks Robin. And um, another question uh, from Hannah. For home modifications, um, just in terms of process, would we get a quote before we meet with the NDIS officer? They usually, look, uh, sometimes the agency doesn't, um, doesn't want to look at quotes that you've received prior to getting your plan. So, if you've got something that's that's very recent in terms of a quote or an OT assessment, then I would I would have that inf that documentation there ready. But quite often the agency says they want another OT assessment done um, before they'll release any funds or make a decision about whether or not they're going to fund you for it. Thanks, Robin. Um, and finally, a question from Kay: um, Can a plan manager be a partner? Be a partner. So I don't know I, the term a partner. Yeah, I, I'm assuming she means a, a loved one. So. Uh, oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Robin. No. Okay. I, I could be corrected on that, but it's my understanding that no. And that would be, um, was that Kay that asked that question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Kay, I know I keep, I know, I'll, I'll keep saying this, but it, it is one of the, the um, basic messages that will come out through this webinar is those sort of questions are always best either put back to the NDIS or your local area coordinator or your support coordinator if you have um, funds in your plan. And I'm going to talk to you about how you build that relationship with your support coordinator or your local area coordinator so that you are getting the right information when you need it after this slide here. So um, I think it's really important that when people have got questions like this, you need to know who to be asking and you need to know that that person is going to come back to you with the right information. So I'll move on. So we now know the different categories in your plan. What I want to talk to you now about is understanding and activating your plan. And you've heard me talk about them already. There are two different people that might be that might help you depending on the funding in your plan. There are local area coordinators or LACs, or you have support coordinators. And I want to talk to you about LACs first. So an LAC is there to help anybody who doesn't have support coordination funds in their plan. And they've got a really important role and this is something that they should be doing for every person that they have allocated to them. So if your local area coordinator is not helping you to do the things that sit in these circles, then you need to be a bit of a squeaky wheel and go back and ask for this help. So the first thing a local area coordinator or an LAC should be helping you to do do is connect to the portal. It's the very first thing they do. Um, they are there to help you to understand your plan and understand the funding in it and how best to use it. They're also there to help you choose and connect with providers if you're struggling with that. They're also there to help you find mainstream and community services. And I'll just explain this a little bit. The NDIS provides funded supports and they're in your, in your plan. But the NDIS still expects that your mainstream and community services are still going to help you because you're a member of your local community. So um, if, if you want to find a local computer course at your library and you don't know how to go about doing it, that is also something your local area coordinator should be helping you with, even there, though there are no dollars attached to that in your plan. So they're a, like a linker to your local community, as well as helping you to link with providers using those funds in your plan. Another really important um, role of, um, of your local area coordinator is to help you to review your plan um, every 12 months because 
most people's plans are for 12 months and prior to that 12 month anniversary, your local area coordinator should be contacting you and making a time to sit down with you and just go through your plan with you, work out what's working, what isn't, maybe um, see if there's any unmet need, whether or not you're meeting your goals so that your plan for next year has the right funding in it and that you're um, able to meet your goals and lead an ordinary life. The other thing that local area coordinators should do is assist you with any paperwork that might need to happen. So if for instance you um, want you want to um, have a review of a decision that the agency's made, if you want a re to request a review, uh, they should be able to help you to download those forms and complete them and give you the right sort of information that needs to be included so that you've got the best possible outcome or if you've had a change of circumstances to help you to fill out that form as well. So you can see from this slide and from what I've told you that your local area coordinator is a really important person in terms of helping you to make the very most out of your plan. So do you know who your LAC is? And what do you do if you don't know? If you don't know who your LAC is, then what I think uh, you need to do, and the best thing you can do is call MS Connect and say to them that you are an NDIS participant, you're struggling to, um, to understand and activate your plan, and you don't know who your local area coordinator is. So um, what MS Connect will do is ask you a few questions and they'll either be able to put you in touch with the agency that runs the local area coordination in your region or put you through to someone like me who can find that out, that out if they can't. So if you don't know who your LAC is, then um, I want you to call MS Connect and they will help you to, to, to find out who that is. Okay. Right, let's move on. So some people might have something called support coordination, support coordination funds in their plan. And a support coordinator is very similar to an LAC, but they're um, somebody completely independent from the agency. And there would be funds in your plan for you to um, employ the services of this person. And their role is to help you understand and action your plan. Uh, they're, they're much more hands-on than an LAC. They're a bit like a, a personal assistant, I guess. They're there to um, help you to build the capacity to, man your plan, to manage your plan yourself over time. They uh, link you up and liaise with the service providers in conjunction with you and always liaising with you in terms of what your, um, what your needs and wants are. They're also there to coordinate your informal your funded and your mainstream supports. And very importantly, they're also there to prepare you for your annual review. So you can see that they're quite similar, except that there's more intense help from a support coordinator. And you can only, um, you only have a support coordinator if you have funds in your plan. We have had people who um, haven't had support coordination funds in their plan are really struggling to get their plan activated and understand it and need um, a higher level of support than they're getting from their local area coordinator. And we've asked for a review of their funding to have support coordination funds put in and that has happened on occasion. So if that applies to you, then um, maybe another call to MS Connect to see how we can help you do that would be useful for you. Belinda, I'll check in again. Thanks, Robin. Um, we've got uh, a question here from Jody, just asking which area of funding would the low risk items come out of? It would come out of your um, capital. Thanks, Robin. I would have thought. Yeah, I would have thought it would come out of capital. 
And we've just had a, um, a comment um, from Elaine just suggesting that the previous question around whether a loved one or a partner could be a plan manager and Elaine saying that they're actually a plan manager for their for their wife. So oh, um, thanks. OK, that's yeah. really good feedback. Thank you. So can I ask the question? Um, are you did did they to become that plan manager? Did you have to become a registered provider? Did they have to become a registered provider? Okay. Well, hopefully, um, Elaine will come back with yeah. a with an answer to that question, Robin. <laughs> it, not, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah. that that yeah. might be an important point to let other people know that if if that's the case, then you would have to become a registered provider. I don't know the answer to that, but thanks, Elaine. Yeah, Elaine's quickly off the mark there and says, "No, I didn't." Okay. Fantastic. So, Elaine, the funds that you've received for plan management, you're paying your partner to do that. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. We'll move on. Okay, so I want to talk to you now about plan reviews because it's important that you understand these because for a lot of people, there's a need for, um, for a plan to be reviewed for a number of reasons. And this gets a bit... Um, not complicated, but it's, it gets a bit convoluted. So you've got two types of plan reviews. You've got unscheduled plan reviews and scheduled plan reviews. So let me talk first about unscheduled plan reviews. And within this, you have three types. So uh, there are three types of requests for a review. The first one is a request for a review because there has been a change of circumstances. And this is um, something that happens quite often for people living with MS because obviously it's a progressive disease or if you have relapsing remitting MS and you have a relapse, your needs might change. And if your needs have changed, say you've had a relapse and gone into hospital um, and you've uh, then had to have some rehab and you've come home and you've got a higher level of, um, of support needs, then the easiest thing to do is uh, complete a change of circumstances form and the agency will provide you with more funds if they think it's reasonable and necessary given your circumstances that um, that there is a high level of funding to tide you over because your needs have changed. Um, there could, with your change of circumstances it could also be um, the fact that you've moved. So it's it sometimes it's not to do with your disability, it's to do with you know your, your your living arrangements as well. The second one is a review of a reviewable decision, and that's their words, not mine, and it's probably one of the most confusing phrases I've ever heard. But this is for people when your plan doesn't reflect the supports and services you need to achieve the goals um, that you've set for yourself and to help you to lead an ordinary life. Uh, the final type of review is something called the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Review and this is for when um, the tribunal is there if you want to dispute an outcome from an internal review. So say for instance uh, you felt that your plan didn't reflect your needs, you uh, completed the form that needs to be filled out and the agency said, no, we don't, we don't think that we need to be providing you with more supports and services. We think that that plan um, is reflecting your needs and you didn't agree with that. You can go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is completely separate to the NDIS and um, completely impartial. So I'm just going to go into each of those reviews in more detail. So a request for a review when your circumstances have changed. So I just want to talk to you about some of the things that might trigger this kind of review. If you have moved house, you need to let the agency know um, and complete that change of circumstances form. If your informal supports have changed, um, and I'll just give you one example. So say you have a partner who has been working and you've needed some supports at home because uh, your partner is working and they have made a decision to retire or to work part time and they're at home now to provide you with more informal supports, you would probably need to let the agency know that that has happened. As I said um, a little earlier, if you've had a change of circumstances because your MS has progressed or if you've had a relapse and um, the supports in your plan don't 
uh, it no longer reflect your needs, then you complete that change of circumstances form. Okay, so that's that's one uh, review. Oh, hang on, I'll just, sorry. I'll just um, talk to you a bit more about that. So you complete the change of circumstances form. It's really important that if you do fill out this form that you attach any relevant reports from specialists, from um, physiotherapists, from whoever um, you think would be appropriate, maybe your neurologist, any assessments or any support letters that you may have, attach them to that form always make and keep a copy of the documents because things go astray um, once you send them back to the NDIS and you don't want to have to go through the whole rigmarole of getting reports all over again. So we always suggest to people have an NDIS file and anything you send to them, make and keep a copy. Submit the form to the NDIS. And I have heard that if you submit the form by email, it obliges them to respond within two weeks. And that response might not be a decision. It might just be, yes, we've received your forms and we'll be looking into it. But I have heard that things happen faster if they're emailed. If you're at all confused or you're struggling to complete the change of circumstances form, your LAC or your support coordinator, if you have support coordination funds, can help you to do that, okay? Let's talk about a request for review of a reviewable decision. So this is, as I said before, when you're putting in this form, it's when your support meet, your plan is not meeting your needs. So say you had your planning conversation with a local area coordinator or another NDIA representative, and you gave them all the relevant information that you thought was necessary for them to um, make decisions about the right funding in your plan. And then your plan came back and um, you're not, and, and you feel that you're not receiving the right supports and the right services and the right funding for it. Then you can submit um, a review of a reviewable decision form. And again, it's really important to attach any relevant reports, assessments or support letters. Um, make and keep a copy of the documents um, and submit the form to the NDIS. And again, your local area coordinator or your support coordinator can help you if you're struggling um, or if you just want to check and see if, you, if they think you've got um, all the relevant information that would help the NDIS to make a decision on your request for that review. Just on that, Robin, we've just had a comment mm -hmm. come through from Maureen just saying that um, they asked for an unscheduled plan review as soon as they received their, um, her husband's first plan as it was not suitable for his needs and not what they'd asked for. Um, and it mm -hmm. took three months for that to happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for that comment. And, it, and it's really true. And unfortunately, uh, what we know is requests for reviews of decisions can take a long time. And um, what I would suggest is that if, if you're in a position where um, there's risk of relationship breakdown, if there's risk of somebody uh, not being able to remain in their own home, or if um, their situation is unsafe and they are at risk, then that, um, that sometimes triggers an escalation of the review and makes it happen faster. So um, I, no guarantees, but it does take, getting a review done take, does take time. And it's as long as a piece of string. For some people it happens quickly and for some this, we know they're still waiting six months. And sometimes getting an advocate to help you when things are not progressing is, is helpful. So things thanks. to, con yeah, sorry, Belinda. Yep. I was just going to say thank, thanks, Robin. And um, <laughs> just whilst we've been talking, um, Kay's just asked, um, does the review of a reviewable decision have to occur within three months of receiving, receiving the plan? Yes. Yes. So if you receive a plan, you've got three months in which to request that review. So there nice. is a time, there is a timeline on you requesting the review. The agency getting back to you with a decision on that review is much more much more flexible. 
but yes, that's right. It's 12 weeks or three months from the date of your plan. Okay. And we've just got lots of people um, feeding in saying that they've had very similar experiences with waiting a long time for those um, reviews to happen. Yep. If somebody is really in difficult circumstances, um, and I'll, I'll reiterate this at the end, um, either contact us at MS because sometimes we can help things uh, move faster, especially if, if it's a, a situation where things are, are becoming untenable or um, or getting an advocate to help you or going to your um, your uh, federal your local federal member and making a bit of a noise and whilst saying that is very easy I understand for people living with MS and their families quite often that's the last thing you want to do because just um, doing everyday things is enough of a challenge without having to expend energy on doing those things but unfortunately um, doing those things does sometimes help make things happen faster. Thanks, Robin. So, yeah, if you're putting in a request for a review or a change of circumstances, it's it, these are really important things to remember because it'll help the agency make a decision and make a decision quickly and maybe not have to come back to you for more information. Always ensure that your request relates to your goals because no support or service anybody receives in an NDIS plan will be there unless it links to somebody's goal. So if your goal is to remain living independently in your own home and in a home that's clean and well maintained and you're not receiving enough funds for that to happen, then you need to explain um, how your goal is not being met because you don't have the right funds. And then explain how you'll be impacted if your request is rejected and put your request in the perspective of um, your economic and, and community participation because they're the bedrocks of the scheme. And what I mean by that is that everybody has a right to be able to, um, to whatever degree they want, be part of their local community and to, um, and to be able to participate in an economic way. And that doesn't mean just working. That means that maybe somebody with a disability who is currently paying for services out of their own pocket, such as getting the home clean because they're not able to do it themselves. Um, if they get an NDIS plan and they get funds to help them keep their home clean, then that money that was previously paid out of your pocket is no longer paid for by you, it's paid for through your, your budget. And that gives you some discretionary spending maybe for some other things that you would like to do that are the ordinary things that we're, you know, that most of us would expect to be doing as part of our economic life in our community. So please keep those things in mind if you're putting in for a review. I just want to talk to you about why a request might be rejected because we know that if you're not clear about how your circumstances have changed, if you want rather than need an increase in supports, then you're not likely to get, have that request um, acknowledged and approved. If your request could be met by mainstream community or informal supports, the agency might decide it's not reasonable and necessary for them to fund it. Um, and if your request didn't provide sufficient evidence to support your request. So wherever possible, if you can evidence why you need the increase in funds, then you're more likely to get a positive answer. Okay, so just a bit more detail on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. So you can request, as I said before, an Administrative Appeals Tribunal review if you disagree with the outcome from a request for a review of a reviewable decision. You need to submit the request to the AAT within 28 days of receiving the decision from the NDIA. So say, for instance, you requested a review of a reviewable decision and the agency came back and said, no, we don't think you need that scooter, for instance. Um, and we don't think it's reasonable and necessary for us to fund that. Um, once you receive that letter telling you that they don't, um, that they are not going to change the funding, then you've only got 28 days in which to approach the AAT to to get them to um, to um, to go to the agency and and help you to appeal the decision. You can fill out an AAT form or write them a letter. 
Um, and for more information, you can call them and the number's on your screen. It's 1800 228 333 or you can visit their website, which is www.aat.gov.au. So before I move on to um, scheduled reviews, I just want to talk to you, I've, you heard me mention a couple of times today about something called reasonable and necessary supports. So the NDIS makes funding decision based on section 34 of the NDIS Act, which is about what they call reasonable and necessary supports. And that's a very ephemeral term. So if you understand what they mean by that, you're better able to understand what you may or may not be eligible for. So I'll just quickly run through the the um, the different categories that they that they make decisions on. So the first one is um, the reasonable expectations of informal supports. So um, the NDIS expects that everybody has informal support networks. Everybody in the community does. I do because I have a husband. Well, actually, no, not everyone will have informal supports, but they will talk to you about them. And I have a husband and I have um, a 26-year-old daughter. The community would expect that those two people that who live with me would provide me with, um, su that, with support, but only support that is reasonable and necessary for them to provide. So um, the community would not, um, would not think that either my partner or my daughter showering me, or toileting me, or having to give up work to care for me, or to give up their studies to care for me, is is reasonable, is a reasonable ex expectation of them. So, so they will look at what your informal support networks do, and if and if they are doing more than is reasonably expected of somebody, then they will put some funded supports in your plan to relieve that. Um, that level of informal support they're providing you with. The reasonable and necessary supports people get in their plans also have to represent value for money. Um, the agency has a budget it's, that it needs to stick to in terms of what the government gives it. It's our taxpayers, all our taxpayer dollars that are helping to pay for the NDIS and we would all expect that whatever funded support somebody got that they would represent value for money. As I said earlier, um, every every support that someone receives has to um, relate back to their goals and their aspirations. So if your goal is to maintain your current level of health and wellness and your fitness, um, that's a perfectly reasonable goal and the supports and services should be put in place to help you to achieve that. If you can't link a support to a goal, it won't be funded. All the reasonable and necessary supports that are funded in your plan are there to facilitate social and economic participation. And I talked about that a little earlier, so I won't repeat it. They also need, all those funded supports also need to be effective and they need to be beneficial for the participant. So the agency will want to see that if, for instance, they're providing you with funds for an exercise physiologist, that 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 is an effective um, use of money and that it is providing benefit to you as the participant. And that's why um, before your annual review, it's always good to get uh, reports from your service providers and um, they will then um, put in that report how the, fun the um, supports they've provided you with have benefited you and helped you to lead a more ordinary life. And finally, the reasonable and necessary supports that are funded in your plan um, are only going to be provided by the NDIS if they're most, lit, most appropriately funded by the NDIS. So the NDIS believes and um, that the other sectors that are out there in the community need to pull their weight as well. So for instance, Department of Housing needs to pull its weight in terms of what it provides to people who are living with a disability and live in any of their homes. Um, it's also reasonable that the health sector continue to uphold its responsibilities and that the NDIS doesn't become the, um, 
the cash cow for for everything which would blow the budget and then pay then the scheme will fall over so that's another reason why the NDIS doesn't pay for um, supports that are funded through health like medications um, so that's reasonable and necessary and if you can if you can understand that you can understand better the sort of supports and services that the agency is going to consider um, when they when they put it put together a plan for you or if you're asking for um, a high level of funded supports because your circumstances have changed or your current plans not meeting your needs okay so we talked about unscheduled plan reviews let's talk about scheduled plan reviews these generally occur on a yearly basis um, prior to your plan end date they're usually conducted by a local area coordinator or an NDIA planner and they can occur face to face or over the phone it's really your choice and their purpose is to discuss your goals were they met have they changed and, and they can change and maybe they should be changing so um, you know you need to have a think about that before your annual review their purpose is also to identify any unmet needs and to make any changes to the funding in your plan if it's required. So we know just like when people first enter the scheme that if somebody is really well prepared for their initial planning conversation, they're more likely to get a better outcome. And the same applies when you're having your annual review. So be well prepared for it. You're more likely to get the plan that's gonna suit your needs. So one of the ways of being well prepared is to, to have a list of your goals and they're in your plan and you might want to get another document together or just write your, your, your goals down and then, and then have a think about the funded supports that were there to help you achieve that goal and then to have a think about whether those supports actually helped you to meet the goals and if they didn't, what were the barriers? So let's say your goal was to stay living independently in your own home and some of the things that you got the funded supports were home modifications, domestic assistance and personal assistance. Have a think about whether those supports um, helped you to meet your goals. And if not, what were the barriers? Was it because you didn't have enough personal assistance? Was it because, um, for instance, somebody moved from um, being a one person to a two person transfer and they didn't have enough funds to cover that extra person helping uh, or maybe um, the home modifications weren't enough to help you to access all areas of your home so have a really good think about each goal have a think about the funded support you got and whether or not you met your goals and why and maybe if you didn't why you didn't and if you can be really clear about those things you're more likely to get um, your next plan reflecting what you actually need you also need to think about um, whether you used all the funding in your plan and if not why didn't you um, because if you didn't use all the funding in your plan and you don't have a good reason for why it wasn't used it um, for one it doesn't roll over into the next year so it doesn't accumulate and two, unless you have a good reason, you may well lose some of those funds that you might have been funded for in the previous year. So um, some examples of why people haven't used all the funding in their plan might be because um, I know of lots of people who got a plan and it took them six months to get it activated because they didn't understand how to do it. Um, and so, you know, they've never caught up and that's why there's still funding left over. So, um, or maybe your LAC didn't fully explain your plan to you and you were really unsure about how to use your funds. Maybe your goals changed and some of the funded supports were no longer relevant. Maybe your plan didn't reflect your needs and you're waiting for the outcome of the NDIA to review the plan um, or your circumstances have changed and it doesn't reflect your needs. And for some people, they have been overfunded and they and they didn't need all the funds that were needed in their plan. So if you get if you are overfunded, I think it's just 
it's the same as if you don't have enough funds. You have a responsibility to, to be honest and, and to use the funds wisely. And if you don't need them, um, then don't use them because you know that's just a, a waste of everybody's money. But you should be using them if you need them. So do you have any unmet need? And it's really good to think about unmet need in these different areas. So do you have any unmet need in terms of home modifications, in terms of personal assistance or transport funds, or maintaining or finding work? What about allied health assessments or therapies? What about support coordination? Were you unable to get your plan up and going because um, you know, your level of cognition makes it difficult or your level of fatigue um, might make it really difficult for you to do it on your own? Perhaps you need some more equipment or you need more help around the house or you're still not accessing or participating in the community to the level that you want. Um, do you have any unmet need in terms of improving your health and fitness? Or do you have unmet needs around continence equipments or assessments or in terms of plan management? So have a think about all of those things and have something written down so that you're really well prepared for that conversation. Because as I said before, if you can articulate really well what your needs are and where the barriers are and where your unmet needs are, you're more likely to get a better plan the next time round. Belinda, do we have any questions? Robin, um, we've got more comments than questions if you wanted to mm -hmm. run through them now. Yeah, I think they're useful because somebody's comment as a participant might help other people that are listening today. So I'm happy to, to go through these comments as well. Um, so Maureen saying that she um, self-manages her husband's plan, but that shouldn't be confused with plan management. Yes, that is true. So if you are self-managing, that means you are responsible to, um, to pay all the invoices, to keep all the relevant documents. And if you're self-managing, generally what happens is you pay for the service and then you upload the, um, the invoice onto the portal and then you're reimbursed by the agency. So that is absolutely different to plan management. You're right. Perfect. And um, from Elaine, Elaine saying that um, they have MS and was expected to do six transfers to get to a clinic, often in 38 um, plus degrees temperatures, um, needing um, home nursing, but keep getting told that this is not reasonable or necessary. The home nursing, uh, look, without going in, I don't know, I don't have enough detail, but just off the top of my head, home nursing, the agency might, the NDIS might, um, might have made a decision that that needs to be covered under the health sector, not under the NDIS. But look, without going into any details, that's, you know, I, that would be my initial reaction. Um, and again, if you're at all confused or you want some help to understand where that funding should be coming, a call to MS Connect or your local area coordinate, local area coordinator or your support coordinator um, to have a conversation about that and, and whether or not it should be funded through the NDIS. But my gut feeling is that the agency's decided that it needs to be funded through the health sector, not them. Thanks, Robin. Um, and just a comment around the AAT process that um, there was an advocate involved and it took seven months and five meetings for the issue to be resolved. Mm. It, it, yes, and, and while I can sit here and blithely say, this is what you can do, I, I recognise that it is, is lengthy, it is exhausting, and for some people, it's just a bridge too far. Yeah. Um, and it shouldn't yeah. be. Um, and I acknowledge that, but at the moment that, that is that is sometimes the way it happens. And Robin, just, just out of curiosity, is there um, a mechanism where those um, that feedback can be captured so NDIS can look at improving their processes over time? 
Yes, so what happens is when we actually get calls from clients about issues like this, we have an issues log that we keep and on a regular basis we send that feedback back to the agency and sometimes um, we'll help that person to, to to get a decision moving if we can or again to give them, you know, to, um, to encourage them to go to an advocate. So yeah, we are always feeding back to the agency about um, situations that we um, we find MS people living with MS in. Yep, absolutely we do. I, I'm going to keep moving, Belinda, because I can see we're running out of time. I've got a few more slides. <laughs> no worries, <laughs> keep going, Robin. Okay, so um, as I said, also being well prepared, look at your goals. Did you achieve them? And it could be a, an absolute yes tick, it could be a no, or it could be a partially, and maybe ha have a think about why it was yes, why it was no, and why it was partially. What were the barriers if you didn't achieve them? And if you did achieve your goal, that doesn't mean that it won't be funded again next year because it could be an ongoing need. Also have a think about as you as you go from your first to your second to your third plan, we're hoping that people's goals will become more sophisticated and more aspirational as you become used to this new way of doing things. So we'd like you to have a think about new goals that you'd like to achieve. And we know that talking to family and friends sometimes about them is a really good way of just bouncing some ideas off them and always have them written down so that you're ready for that plan review. Um, I've just put up on the screen um, our the, the contacts that are really helpful. MS Connect, as I said, is always your first port of call if you've got a question about the NDIS and you haven't had any luck with a support coordinator or your local area coordinator, then give MS Connect a call. Um, and also the NDIS. I know sometimes people have to wait on the line a fair time, but um, if you want it from the horse's mouth, always try and go back to the NDIS. Just a quick reminder about the supports and services that we provide as a, as a registered provider. So we are registered to provide support coordination, community participation, short-term accommodation, which um, is better known, more um, commonly known of as respite, exercise physiology and personal training, specialist continence assessments, and physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Um, and again, MS Connect is a great place to start with that. A final hint, and I've talked about this before. If you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall and you can't make headway with the NDIA um, in terms of decisions, approvals or assistance with request for changes to your funding, then um, contact your disability advocacy agency in your um, region or uh, contact your local federal member. And I do recognise that that is an exhausting exercise, but um, what we know is that people who have advocates or who have gone to their local federal MP have sometimes had a faster and better outcome than those that haven't. And finally, any questions in the last minute or so, Belinda? I've rushed you a bit. No, no, no problems, um, Robin. If you've got time, we've got a couple of um, yep, I do. more yep. comments and things that people have um, sent through. Um, mm -hmm. So um, Yvonne was just saying that um, not everyone has informal supports and I support a person who is 64 and has no living family. He lives alone um, and he has no informal supports whatsoever. And that should be taken, and yes, I, I, I mean, I shouldn't have said before so blithely that, that you know, people have informal supports. Some don't. And the agency, agency should be taking that into account. And that's where um, if somebody is, is very isolated, doesn't have anyone to help them to activate their plan and is struggling, that's where the local area coordinator should be playing a really big role. And if the local area coordinator isn't, then that person should be um, receiving funding for support coordination, to be honest. Absolutely, because some people don't have those supports and they're not lucky enough to have it and it's very difficult for them. Yeah, thanks Robin. Um, Elaine's saying um, we didn't get to see the plan first and we got too much in a particular category and not enough in another. Mm. So when the uh, when the NDIS rolled out in the trial areas, one of the things they was they were doing was um, before a plan was finalised, a participant got to see it so that it could be tweaked. 
um, the agency in its um, wisdom decided once full scheme rollout happened that they would no longer do that. There was such an uproar about that and so many people got bad plans that, don't ask me why, instead of just going back to the old system they had in a pilot, in the pilots in Barwon and um, Newcastle, they have um, piloted um, sending uh, draft plans back to people in one specific region in Victoria and we're hoping that they will roll out that new um, practice across um, all states once this pilot's over because we know that um, if people get to have a look at their plan before it's finalised and ticked off then that's when you can tweak it and it means you're less likely to have to go through that ridiculous um, and time consuming review process when your plan's not meeting your needs. Yep. Yeah, thanks Robin. Um, Kay, Kay's saying, um, when my plan was made, they did not want to know what I had written down, but only what the NDIS person put into the template she was filling out. Mm. Yep. And they, that information gatherer, the LAC who, or the NDIA planner, um, is you know they're your they're your connection and if they're not getting it right and they're not putting down the right information that's when people get bad plans and we know that some LACs are better than others and can I just can I say finally I'm happy to take more comments but can I say finally that a lot of the discussion that we've had today is about the the negative um, aspects of the scheme and whilst there is a lot of negativity around some people's plans not meeting their needs, I, I personally and MS as an organisation are very committed to the NDIS and, and the concept of it and we know that for a lot of people it is changing their lives and there are a lot of hiccups. It's a huge scheme that's being rolled out very quickly and whilst I'm not trying to excuse them, it is going to take a while for this to, for things to be resolved. Um, but the basic, ten, the basic concept of the scheme is something that's good. It is better than what we, what people with disability have had in the past. And if we can just hold on to that, and I know that's easy for me to say, but the scheme is good. It just, it, it does need some fixing up. Yeah, and um, we've got some feedback here from um, from Kay saying um, that she thinks the NDIS is fantastic, and I'm really grateful for all that I get. Kay, that that's you, that's great. You, you should. I have to say, I don't think you should be grateful. You should be able to lead an ordinary life like everybody else, and you're entitled. You know, people with MS um, who are living with functional impairment and are unable to do everyday tasks should be entitled to the sorts of funds. That that let them lead a more ordinary life. So um, wherever we hear of that happening, it really makes us think, you know, that, yep, the scheme is good. It has its drawbacks, but it, it basically it is a good scheme. Yeah. And just and she's just saying that um, she didn't have anything prior to the NDIS. <laughs> yes. Yeah, lots of people are in your situation, Kay, and it's wonderful when things change for you. Yeah, and um, a few comments around, um, you know, NDIS um, helping in terms of having care and support at, at home. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's great. That's really good to hear. And uh, some plugs for disability advocacy if people are needing that, that extra um, support and assistance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really good to keep that in mind because it's hard to do on your own, especially if you're struggling with a lot of other things around your health. Absolutely, yeah. So no, no particular comments. Um, just, I'm sorry, no particular questions, Robin. Um, just quite a few comments around um, what we've been talking about around the NDIS. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's really good because it gives everyone else that's on the line, um, you know, a chance to hear how things are working well for some people, and it is changing things. And I'd like, um, like to thank everyone for being online today. And Belinda, thanks for facilitating as well. No, no problems, Robin. And just before um, people head off, only if you've got time, we've just got a really quick um, few slides to finish up today. So I'll grab um, control back from, from Robin uh, and I'll quickly go through those, those last few slides for everybody. 
So this is just some information for everyone around Get Your Act Together, which is, a, which is a, an online tool designed to help better manage your multiple sclerosis symptoms. So at the moment, it's focusing on emotions, fatigue and continence, and there are three more symptoms coming soon. So watch this space for some more information, but um, designed primarily for people in the ACT, but does give general and useful information for all people living with MS. So if you're interested, check out the MS website and search Get Your Act Together. Some information about MS wellbeing. So at the moment, I understand that the Go For Gold scholarships are open and they can be um, helpful for people um, living with multiple sclerosis who wish to follow a dream and they be, may be around um, a particular topic. Um, for example, in the past, there's been things about um, education, travel, arts, music, sports, employment and lifestyle. Um, so their value is up to $3,000. Um, in value. So have a look at the MS Go for Gold application form which is available on the website. Uh, MS Financial Assistance Program, so just a little word to let you know that the MS Financial Assistance Program is available for one-off funds to help people in financial hardship. The funds can be used to purchase equipment such as air conditioners to promote quality of life um, to, and help with health related matters. And just a really big thank you to Robin for her time today and her wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for tuning in and hearing about um, more about the NDIS. Thanks everyone and we'll say goodbye for now. <laughs>